Angela, are we good? Yes, you can start. Good. Good morning, everybody. This is Russell Lowe speaking, and it is a real pleasure to be with you this morning and to talk about myopia management with Paragon CRT. Um, I'd like to thank you for tuning in uh, so early this morning. And um, before we get underway, I'd just like to acknowledge our sponsors. That's um, Contact Lens Center in Australia and, of course, Paragon Vision Sciences in the US. Um, now, this is the second webinar in a series of four that Paragon Vision Sciences are presenting and making available for you this year. I'd just like to draw your attention to the third webinar coming up in September, um, which will be Angela Kasparek from Paragon speaking on integrating CRT into the practice. And then in December, we have Ken Kopp talking to us about the dual axis uh, lens design for astigmatic corneal shapes. And that, uh, those two presentations will be extremely important. Now, as far as today goes, I thought I would commence with um, a metaphor of this rather ancient map of the early coastline of Australia. The metaphor being that it kind of represents where we're at in some ways with our, our knowledge of myopia and its complexities, uh, progressive myopia, and ways to, uh, to manage and retard the uh, progression. So I think at this point in time, uh, we're, we're taking great strides, but we certainly uh, understand that we've got a long way to go yet. So I'm going to speak a little more on progressive myopia. Um, I'd like to specifically mention Paragon CRT and why I find that uh, such a, a great product to use in this field. I'm going to stress the importance of the base curve, the treatment curve, and the refraction over lens or the over refraction. And finally, we'll take a look at some um, you know, aspects of longitudinal patient management. So let's talk about progressive myopia. And I imagine that uh, most of uh, the attendees this morning know very well that we have a big problem uh, globally um, that uh, is um, in influencing the, uh, the uh, young people of uh, today with um, a myopic epidemic and uh, the, the risks that that pre uh, presents to their um, future ocular health. And in fact, Noel Brennan has produced some very interesting numbers that have been widely quoted. Um, and according to Noel's number crunching, if we can be successful with a therapy that reduces the rate of myopia progression by 33%, then we end up with a decrease in the prevalence or the frequency of high myopia of 73%. That's high myopia defined as five diopters of myopia. If we can be a little more effective and reduce that rate of myopia progression to 50%, then we end up reducing high myopia by 90%. So um, that's really quite um, achievable target, we would like to think. And why do we uh, have an interest in this? Well, we do know that myopia, of course, increases the risk of some of these uh, very, very serious ocular pathologies. So myopia is clearly not just a refractive anomaly. It is um, a much more important uh, situation for our young people than that alone. Now, there was a paper published in 2012 by Ian Flickcroft, which is just, um, I find, one of the most interesting papers I have read. Very, very 40-odd pages of, uh, of complex thinking on myopia. But one of the things that Ian uh, gives our attention to is that really the idea of physiological myopia is a bit of a furphy, given that any level of myopia carries with it an increase in the risk of ocular pathology. And as the myopia increases, for every diopter of increase, there is an increase in the level of that risk. So um, even low myopia um, is something of a problem. 
Now, there has been a lot said in uh, fairly recent times about uh, the protective value of being outdoors, and this was first identified by Catherine Rose in a study known as the Sydney Myopia Study, and her group identified that outdoor time, not necessarily playing sport, but just being outside, is protective. This is really interesting and it's certainly uh, good advice that we can give our patients, but I will make the point that when I talk to you about the results of in our clinical population, we've never really gone to give any advice on behaviour. We don't tell our children to spend less time on computers, less time on their smartphones or their tablets or to spend more time outdoors. Uh, the results that we have have purely been as a product of the uh, um, association with the therapy with Paragon CRT. Nonetheless, this is really interesting and I find that um, uh, the more I read about this, uh, the more interesting it gets. So we have had a number of uh, laboratory uh, experiments conducted since then that have um, kind of um, given um, support to the idea with uh, animal models in the laboratory. And most recently, again, uh, Ian Flitcroft um, has a different understanding of why outdoors might be protective, and he talks about dioptric differences to the eye between indoors and outdoors. And a little bit about that. Ian has produced these computer-generated dioptric maps showing the error, given that the eye can only be in focus in a single plane at any given point in time, when we're outdoors, the error in focusing tends to be rather low. And as you can see, these, uh, these colour charts on the right here are very, very soft. Indoors, it's a different story. And when we're focused, for example, across the room, um, sitting at a desk with a computer in front of us, that situation generates a great deal of hyperopic um, a combination focusing error. And it is very interesting that if we can introduce a therapy that presents to the eye along with foveal correction simultaneous peripheral plus power, then that hyperopic error indoors is largely eliminated. Now when we look at the available myopia control technologies, we have optical technologies such as bifocals, multifocals, the spectacle based technologies. We have a number of emerging contact lens technologies such as dual focus soft lenses and multifocal soft lenses as well as um, orthokeratology which is really um, developing uh, a, a name for our number one optical, uh, being our number one optical choice of therapy. And uh, this morning, yes, we do acknowledge that pharmacological uh, interventions are being um, uh, developed, but at this stage um, I think we have a long way to go before we can really safely uh, be assured that these uh, pharmacological approaches are safe in the long term. So anyway, back to optical and when we look at some of the patterns that are out there and this website I would refer you to is a particularly interesting one, myopiaprevention.org. You can find there a list of uh, a large number of um, patents that you can scrutinize and uh, you'll find that most of the optical uh, inventions that are out there uh, share the common uh, property of one way or another introducing simultaneous peripheral plus power to the eye at the same time as their foveal correction. One such patent is, um, comes from the work of Earl Smith who in 2006 presented this information about a preferred way to treat our progressive myopes and uh, Earl discovered uh, with his uh, work with monkeys that if we could provide peripheral plus then the image shell presented to the eye would have um, uh, sufficient curvature to avoid peripheral hyperopic defocus and um, that seems to remove the stimulus for axial growth or axial elongation of the eye. 
Lo and behold, uh, I've stolen this uh, slide from uh, Randy Kajina and uh, Pat Caroline and their work. Um, borrowed is probably a better word. And with due acknowledgement, I'd just like to uh, use this slide to point out that with orthokeratology and corneal reshaping, that we do in fact get exactly that kind of image that uh, Earl was uh, speaking to, meaning that we have a very highly aspheric treatment zone where the area of optimal correction here for a 5-diopter myope is relatively small, around about a 2 millimeter part of the treatment zone. And beyond that, we have this increasing uh, plus power towards the periphery of the treatment zone. So we end up with a very aspheric treatment zone, which produces that image curvature that removes the uh, hyperopic peripheral uh, stimulus to axial elongation. And all of this is um, you know, knowledge that we are armed with today in our clinical practice. But I think back to the early days, I've been um, working with children since um, before the year 2000. And uh, for the first several years, I used to look at these treatment maps and wonder just how come we were doing so well with our kids. So, really had no clue as to what we were doing. We even knew that we had an increase in the positive spherical aberration uh, with our treatment zones, but uh, unfortunately I just wasn't able to put one and one together and understand why it might be that our kids were showing such impressive stability with their progressive myopia once they commenced uh, our corneal reshaping treatments. So uh, let's talk a little bit now about Paragon CRT. Um, and I'd like to lead in by saying that um, although in the United States uh, CRT was the first um, corneal reshaping uh, therapy to, be, uh, to receive FDA approval way back in uh, June in 2002, um, today it, it still does not have approval for specifically for myopia control. So that is the reason why in the marketing, the, uh, the company has to be very, very careful about uh, what they say with myopia control. Really, the, uh, the studies have not really been presented to the FDA uh, to a point where an approval for this uh, indication uh, has been granted. Now, certainly in Australia and around the world and uh, probably within the United States um, where we're seeing a lot of practitioners doing uh, a lot of good work with myopia control, but we're really um, calling our treatments uh, typical orthokeratology treatments and we're not really um, formally calling them myopia control and hence the, um, the, uh, the late change with the title of this presentation. Nonetheless, I think you'll see as I go through some of these slides that we are um, achieving some incredible results with our young children. One of the reasons why I, I, I really like working with Paragon CRT is the advantages that they uh, have. And the number one advantage is the, the fact that we don't have a reverse geometry design here. Specifically, we have a sigmoid curve that controls the, uh, largely controls the centration and the um, the pressure that the lens is able to exert on the surface of the, uh, of the eye. And we mentioned that in the first webinar and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little more about that but not too much. Um, it, it is incredibly important that we can independently change the fitting parameters of the lens without changing the base curve. So from time to time with patient management, it is important to consider changing the fit of the lens for one reason or another, but very often we do not want to change the base curve, and that we can achieve with Paragon CRT. And of course, the inventory is a wonderful thing to have in your practice because working with children, you don't have to wait for um, you know, a, a manufacturing and shipping lead time. You've got the lenses there on the shelf, and that just makes everything so much more efficient. Now, a little bit of a word or two about the base curve. When I'm talking to people, um, practitioners, uh, hand-checking them into the, into the um, uh, early stages of their um, experience with CRT, so often I find that they have um, a little bit of confusion and difficulty thinking about the base curve. 
so if you'll just bear with me, I'd just like to draw um, attention to the difference between the base curve of an alignment fit um, GP lens, where really the, um, the base curve is an important fitting um, consideration, and, and we alter the base curve by 0.1 or 0.2, and we know that that can make a difference to the patient comfort and the way the lens behaves on the eye. This is just not the case with Paragon CRT. And as I've said uh, in the first webinar, the base curve has nothing to do with the fit of the Paragon CRT lens. The base curve is chosen to drive the degree of treatment. It must accord with the axial length of the eye. And um, it, it's very important that we do not confuse these two different uh, applications of base curve. And remember that the Paragon CRT lens, even though it is, is made of a gas permeable material and it somewhat resembles a gas permeable contact lens, it really is a very different uh, beast uh, in, in how it behaves and, and, uh, and its function. So moving on, uh, the sigmoid curve that I mentioned before uh, is the technology that we have to control the uh, returns, uh, the, um, the sagittal depth of the lens, and it really functions like a, a very simple hydraulic lift that makes it very easy to um, alter the amount of force that the lens applies due to its proximity to the surface of the cornea. And this is important because we can have the correct base curve on the eye and still get an incomplete treatment simply because the lens isn't fit correctly. So instead of changing the base curve, we have to first of all remember to double check that the fit is as we need it to be. Now let's talk a little bit more about this very important concept in myopia management of the base curve and the refraction over the lens. So when it comes to research, um, clearly the gold standard for um, myopia control and um, myopia um, is, is a, a biometric measurement of the axial length of the eye using uh, uh, an A-scan uh, technique usually. Clinically, we don't normally have access to that technology and we rely on refraction. So if we have a young patient whose refraction uh, increases over time, then we, uh, we realize that we're dealing with a progressive myope. Now the real question is what do we do with uh, corneal reshaping when we don't have uh, ready access uh, to a um, kind of um, un- uh, uh, inhibited uh, refraction and my um, suggestion is that we really don't need to wash the patient out of treatment to find out what's going on. We can, we can follow their progression and their uh, performance during treatment by looking at the base curve and the refraction over lens which is simply the over refraction. So I think it's extremely important and it is of course part of the Paragon CRT workup to measure and record the refraction over lens with the treatment lens at the very beginning of the, um, the treatment program. So you can refer back to this over the years. So if we have an 8-9 base curve and a plano refraction over lens, then this is a measure of the refractive status of the eye at that point in time. And if that refraction over lens changes, then with the same base curve lens on the eye, the only thing that could really be changing is the axial length of the eye. So the base curve drives the degree of myopia treatment. And um, although this uh, diagram is highly schematic and simplified, let me say that the base curve is one way or another matched to the axial length of the eye. And this is really dictated by the Jessen formula. And George Jessen, way back in 1962, came up with this formula. It's a little bit of an approximation, and the approximation has been criticized. Nonetheless, clinically, it works incredibly well. And I certainly find that it's, um, it is accurate enough 
um, in my practice um, to give me a very, very good clinical uh, tool with which to work. And the Jessen formula basically uh, just simply says that the indicated base curve is the one that gives the reflection, refraction over lens equal to Plano. So in this example, if we have a 44 diopter cornea and a 2 diopter myoc, we need to flatten that uh, base curve to 42 diopters to provide an emetropic um, uh, situation for the uh, treated eyeball. Very, very simple arithmetic. So a change in the refraction over lens with the lens on the eye simply suggests a change over time in the axial length of the eye. I, I cannot imagine how else um, we could explain that situation other than a change in the axial length of the eye. And conversely, if the axial length of the eye remains constant, we would expect the refraction over the lens with the same lens in place on the eye to remain constant. And this um, uh, workup that we know from uh, our Paragon CRT um, clinical um, fitting guide uh, is, is the, um, the guideline that we have. So when the ROL is planar, we know the base curve is correct. If we get a refraction over lens of minus 0.5, we know we need to flatten the base curve. And conversely, a positive refraction over lens means the base curve is too flat and we need to adjust it a little steeper. Now, I would warn you, I think we need to bear in mind that if we compensate for a poor fit by just simply flattening the base curve a little, so we've got a, a patient who comes in and they're seeing 6.9 or 6.12 uncorrected, and we think, oh, well, we've done everything we can to get the fit right. Let's just go from, say, 8.8 .8 to 8.9 and see if that generates a little bit more treatment. I think this is potentially dangerous in terms of myopia control because we know we're over minusing the eye. And when we over minus the eye, surely we introduce or reintroduce a potential for peripheral hyperopic defocus. And yes, the young eye can accommodate, but accommodation is um, a tricky uh, scenario and um, we know that accommodation is associated with um, a decrease in the positive spherical aberration and it all gets a little complicated. So to keep it simple, um, a real um, guiding philosophy over the years for the way I work with Paragon CRT is to stick very strictly to the, um, to the lowest or the, um, the steepest base curve that will um, that will um, be give me the indicated treatment and, and not to over minus the eye. I think this is rather important for myopia control. And here is an example of some of the results that we have. So this young lady who um, was um, our um, photogenic seven-year-old, we've used her um, picture taking, uh, uh, applying the lens and, um, she, uh, and, and, and um, adapting to treatment many, many times over the years. This young lady just was um, the model uh, CRT patient. And uh, she has been with us now for 12 years. Uh, she started as a, a minus three diopter myope in each eye. Um, and uh, 12 years later, she is now um, a very uh, uh, attractive young lady and uh, the point of the slide is that in all this time her um, CRT base curve has remained unchanged at 8.6 right and left uh, for 12 years and uh, we think that this is pretty wonderful because um, in the year or two prior to coming in to see me we have a, a detailed history of just how rapidly her myopia was progressing uh, in those early years. So um, here is a snapshot of this patient's um, follow-up visits over um, many years of treatment. And what I want to point out to you here is that um, many of the visits she, she would come in for her aftercare and we would find that sure enough she'd, she'd turn up and she'd be six on six uncorrected. But certainly it is not unusual for patients to turn up and show 
reduced uncorrected visual acuity. So here we have 612 a number of times and one eye doing 6 on 9 a number of times. And along the way, we've uh, very often had to work hard to get this patient back to six on six. And the point of the slide is that um, over all of those years, we have never had to change the base curve. So the management has usually involved simply replacing with a duplicate new pair of lenses. And, um, and, and we've watched and found how that can um, rapidly improve the situation back to 6.6. Six. Sometimes we just uh, clean the lenses with an intensive clean. Uh, we've never really had to refit the lenses in this case, but occasionally that is required. So I would call um, a change in the base curve as a last resort and something we only do when we see uh, a, a change in the refraction over the lens with the lens on the eye. Now, you might wonder why, why um, uh, well, let me start again here. I guess at times we're a little concerned to see our patient come in 612, but really um, 612 is pretty functional visual acuity. It's, 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 it's not all that bad. And I think um, patients who are corrected with spectacles, who after all represent still the vast majority of our young myopes, uh, um, they, they often get to very high levels of, um, of corrected visual acuity just simply as their myopia uh, progresses and they don't keep up with that um, in terms of changing their um, refractive correction frequently enough. So how often do we see young people come in and their best, their best um, a visual acuity is around about 618 or 624 simply because their glasses are uncorrected or they haven't yet um, got a correction. So I think when we uh, treat patients with uh, corneal reshaping and we see them coming in for their aftercares and their visual acuity fluctuates from time to time within that 6, 6 to 612 range, um, this shouldn't really give us too much cause for concern. And um, Thinking of um, the requirements visually for um, myopia control, we do know from Earl Smith's work um, back in 2009 that the fovea is not required for regulation of um, axial growth of the eye. However, it's, um, it is important that we keep um, patients seeing trying to dismiss the need for clear vision. I'm just um, perhaps suggesting that a little bit We must also remember that accommodation control um, relies on foveal vision. So that's uh, something I think that we still certainly don't necessarily fully understand today. So now I'd like to talk about longitudinal management and a little bit more about, um, about how um, I think in, in this area. So I'd like to keep in mind a couple of things. First of all, what was the primary treatment objective? And for me, what it's all about with our young children is to slow the rate of axial elongation of the eye. So this is our primary uh, goal. And when patients come in, I like to remind them and the parents of why we're doing this for them. The secondary treatment objective, of course, is just to provide clear, functional, unaided visual acuity so that these young children enjoy life without the need for spectacles and without the need for daytime contact lenses. And um, even if we, we had poor myopia management, our children are incredibly happy to be um, seeing well uncorrected. So this is a really desirable treatment for our children with the added bonus of uh, myopia management and, um, and stability of their prescriptions. There's one other thing that um, we also um, bear in mind at all times, and that is the need for safety. And that's why we do all those checks with the slit lamp and why we need to uh, consider patient compliance. Every time they come in, I always use that as, a, as an opportunity to just um, go over some of the aspects of compliance. So I put together this, um, this little bar chart to give you an idea of what my um, 
my management decisions tend to be on, on average. So if, if I had 100 consecutive uh, patient visits, visits to the practice, this is kind of what um, would um, likely happen in terms of uh, a decision profile at the end of each visit. And as you can see here, more often than not, um, you will see, uh, I've, we've estimated, and I've shared this around the office with some of my support staff, and we're all pretty confident that something like 60% of the time, we don't need to, um, to take any action at all. Excuse me. So around about 60% of our, our clinical uh, follow-up visits require no change in the prescription, and um, everything's hunky-dory, and we'll see you again in, in six months. Now, when we do take action, the most common action that we require is really just a new duplicate pair of lenses with no change whatsoever to the parameters of the prescription lens. So that probably represents around about maybe uh, something like 25 to 30 percent of our patient visits, we end up with a new duplicate lens. And that will depend a little bit on just how often you, uh, you bring your patients back for review. Now what's interesting is up the top we have these three uh, examples of where uh, something needs to be done in terms of management. And um, without any question, the most common um, modification or clinical uh, alteration that we find that we need to do is to refit the patient somewhere down the line with a dual axis lens design. So here we're, we don't have to change the base curve, we have uh, a planar refraction over lens, but we find that we're not getting an adequate treatment over time for one reason or another. This might take 12, 24 uh, months of treatment to become apparent sometimes, but um, that's our most common scenario. And I'm not going to talk about that, I'm going to leave that to Ken Kopp in December to run through um, the uh, thinking that goes with um, the dual axis lens. Very rarely we need to refit the, um, the spherical uh, lens and uh, the most common thing that we need to do here is we, um, we, we sometimes need to change the sagittal depth of the fitting and, and sometimes we need to, um, to decrease um, the return zone depth. Now we've estimated around about 1%, but I would think it quite likely is less than that, but around about one patient visit in 100 or less, do we need to change the base curve because of evidence of um, a change in the refraction over lens, which we attribute to a change in the axial length of the eye. So as you can see in our, in our clinical population, changing uh, base curve is very, very rare indeed. So um, when we look at this again in terms of um, the, the things that I uh, consider in long term management, I'll talk a little more just now on base curve. I want to reintroduce John Mountford's term. And we are very grateful to John for uh, pioneering orthokeratology in Australia and around the world to some extent. And John was very, very keen on the term squeeze film force. And I'm going to reintroduce So I want to talk briefly about the film force. I'd like to just discuss patient JK, who really um, was a model patient with very, very stable um, um, base curve and um, results for the first two years of treatment. So for 24 months, he came in a number of times. He always came in and, and had um, outstanding uh, uncorrected visual acuity of six on six or even better, six on five a couple of times here in NHI. And when we did his corneal, corneal topography plots, they always look uh, picture um, perfect, the sort of plots that I would love to uh, present at a meeting somewhere where they, we have these wonderful um, axial um, 
uh, treatment zones, well centered and very well um, formed, nice spherical looking rings of treatment. And then lo and behold, um, some two and a half um, to three years into treatment, we started running into some problems. And um, sure enough, we, we had a reduction in uncorrected visual acuity at his aftercare and the lenses were still fitting perfect but all of a sudden we had a refraction over the lens of minus 050 and then um, we made a change and we, we changed the base curve to 8.2 and his visual acuity improved immediately uncorrected and a little later on at a subsequent follow-up once again, there was a reduction in uncorrected visual acuity and um, he went to 612 uh, with another need to uh, flatten the base curve uh, in what we can only imagine has been uh, some evidence of um, myopic progression. Now, since then, he has remained stable again and overall his um, progression has been a long way less than it might have been expected had he been wearing spectacles or daytime contact lenses. So we're still very happy with his treatment. But what is a little bit disturbing is the fact that I have no way of predicting um, who among my patient profile is the patient who is going to do this. Who is the one out of the blue who is going to uh, exhibit this sort of unexpected change in their um, myopic prescription. So we still have work to do. Um, this is a rather difficult slide. Um, I've probably already said this, but I just want to try and um, once again cover what we do in this example here. So we have a patient with a new lens, comes in for follow-up, the uncorrected visual acuity is 612, and we measure subjective of minus one that brings the patient down to 66 plus. What do we do? Do we, do we flatten the base curve? Well, you might have gathered, um, if, um, if you followed my thinking so far, that absolutely not. We do not want to flatten the base curve until we check with the lens on the eye and perform an over-refraction. If the refraction over lens is plano, we do not change the base curve, we have to think about the fit of the lens and that's the next couple of slides. Conversely, patient comes in with an older lens and here I'm thinking of a lens that's maybe six months or, or 12 months or older and same scenario, we get um, 612 uncorrected and a minus one subjective. Very often here we commence with a new duplicate lens, we don't change the base curve, we don't change anything, we just dispense that duplicate lens. We might perform the refraction over lens with the lens on the eye and we usually find that that's a plano and we don't have to do anything else to manage the patient. Now in a busy clinical scenario, it's really nice to know that most often when a patient's not doing so well, we don't have to do anything but just give them a new pair of lenses or maybe give their current lenses an intensive clean. That's sometimes all we need to do as well. So it's not all that often we have to do anything, but when we need to change something, occasionally we have to uh, readdress the fit or manage the patient in terms of what John calls the squeeze film force. And this is a very, very old slide that talks about some of the basic principles of corneal reshaping. So we know that we have a positive pressure or squeeze film force at the apex here and in the mid periphery we have a negative or suction squeeze film force that tends to thicken the corneal epithelium in the mid periphery. Now with this theory of squeeze film forces um, we certainly um, assume a great deal. Um, let's talk first of all about proximity. So in a situation here where we have the lens on the eye, this is a situation where I might have fitted the lens initially with a little too much return zone depth in order to make sure that I'm getting excellent 
centration of the lens during the fitting. So at the very beginning, uh, centration is paramount. Sometimes over, over the months, we find that we're not getting an adequate treatment because we just don't have enough pressure here, enough proximity between the lens and the eye. There's nothing wrong with the base curve, but we have to lower down that return zone to achieve this scenario where we have a much uh, greater aplanation pressure against the, uh, the apex of the eye. Seen again here with uh, white light saturation, which is an interesting way to look at the lens on the eye. So sometimes a simple refit is necessary to, um, to improve our clinical results um, without actually changing the base curve of the lens. In other scenarios, we might have a lens that looks like this. And occasionally we find that we start off with a spherical lens on the eye. That might last for um, many, many months, sometimes 12 months, and our results are reasonably good. And then ev eventually we find that, um, that this lens just isn't um, um, providing an adequate treatment. And once again, um, the refraction over lens might be plano, and if we have an astigmatic, sorry, and I'll jump one there. If we have an astigmatic periphery of the cornea, we may have to refit that patient with a dual axis lens design to seal off the, um, the pressure leak that's occurring here in this vertical axis. We see a lot of uh, fluid leak here, and we're losing pressure, and we're not getting a very adequate um, squeeze film force because of this pressure leak. And when we fit with dual axis, we seal off the lens and, um, and we get a much better uncorrected visual acuity score without changing the base curve. Another um, very important uh, aspect is um, the nature of the post-lens tear film. And there are many, many scenarios, even with our young children, where the uh, the tear film has a high level of mucus. So um, I've shown here this slide where we have some um, um, papillary conjunctivitis and a very unstable precorneal tear film. Um, sometimes we find with our uh, Asian eyelids we have a little bit of um, eyelash interaction with the ocular surface, a sort of dystrichiasis that um, can produce a little bit of um, staining and certainly a lot of mucus in the tear film. And um, certainly as the lenses themselves get older, we find we can develop uh, a bit of film deposit. Any of these factors can lead to uh, what I would consider to be a heterogeneous post-lens tear film. And where that tear film is not uh, homogeneous and consistent across uh, the, the lens, we're going to um, get some unpredictability with our overnight treatment. And I think this has a lot to do with why patients come in from time to time and um, they find that their uncorrected visual acuity um, is a sort of changes a little bit from day to day. It's just not as consistent as they would like it to be. So to address this, we might um, have to consider addressing any low-level uh, ocular inflammatory disorder, uh, maybe uh, make sure that our lenses are clean, make sure that our patient handling is um, consistent and um, we're not putting fingerprint onto the lens before the, the patient goes to sleep, a whole bunch of stuff that we can do. And I've kind of summarized these things here on the slide. Um, we, we always prescribe lubricant eye drops for the patient before they apply the lens. So the drops go to the eye and into the lens before the lens is applied to the eye at night. We always prescribe blink exercises for the patient to help stabilize the lens on the eye and to establish an adequate post-lens tear film. As I mentioned, we may wish to consider uh, dealing with any uh, minor inflammatory conditions that the patient may manifest from time to time. Um, we may uh, need to consider uh, the condition of the lens and either clean it in the office or replace it with a new lens from time to time. And certainly the patient lens handling technique, I think, presents a very important variable that we need to consider when we try to get patients to take consistent results from day to day. And all this um, becomes uh, a part of the patient compliance and uh, 
last slide I showed in the first seminar. I don't want to labour it again, but we do um, ask each child to re be responsible for their own care. We spend a lot of time at the very beginning with their training and we, um, we monitor that from time to time. We make sure our patients um, remain on track and uh, look after their lenses the way we expect them to. Um, the parents uh, are involved as supervisors with all of this and uh, we see our children very, very frequently. Usually twice a year minimum and uh, sometimes three or four times a year as required. So safety, uh, very much our uh, number one concern and uh, I love this slide, it just basically um, reminds me to think of the long haul here and success in the long haul does require ongoing attention to detail. So we have to put in the hard yards to make sure our patients um, are, are keeping on track over the, over the years. And with these patients, um, they're going to be with you for, um, for many, many years and that's, that's a wonderful thing. So look, I'm just going to finish up with a, a brief touch of um, a number of unresolved issues as I see it. Um, and uh, certainly as we look into our fluorescent crystal ball here, um, I think there's a lot of work uh, needs to be done. We certainly don't understand um, what is an optical, uh, optimal minimum dose of, of wear time for our patients. Uh, we don't really know all that much about a critical period. Can we do corneal reshaping for a number of years and then find that our patients remain stable thereafter? I uh, have little doubt personally that accommodation is uh, involved in this whole process of myopia and uh, myopia progression and myopia control and um, this is part of the story of not over minusing the lens in my opinion. Uh, we know that centration is important, uh, we accept small amounts of decentration, uh, sometimes that's inevitable. Um, I just wonder really um, if we have larger amounts of decentration, what sort of treatment uh, do we get uh, with myopia control? How important is it in the long term? Uh, this is somewhat unknown. Optical treatment design, well uh, really um, there are, there are um, this research going on uh, around the world looking at um, uh, various patents for optimizing the treatment zone. Uh, we really don't know for sure that overcorrection is important, but I, I, I just suspect that it's, um, it is, and it's certainly the way that I have practiced uh, over the years, and we get uh, wonderful results. So I think we're doing something right, and I think it probably is important. Um, the ever-present question of a rebound effect, uh, we don't have too many patients who have discontinued their, their CRT. Most of our patients like to stay in their CRT, but from time to time um, we have had the occasional discontinuation. And uh, when we've been able to follow the patients up, I can assure you that we have not seen any evidence of a rebound effect, but we're not in a position yet to be uh, absolutely confident about that. Supplementation, um, time outdoors, maybe some pharmacology, uh, maybe some uh, other management strategies to go with CRT, that I will leave to your own clinical judgment. I think that's um, paramount here. Um, all I can say is that really uh, we have done virtually nothing other than the uh, basic CRT treatment for our children. And really the key question for me as far as this talk goes in particular, um, is can we be sure that our base curve sta stability over the years really does mean that there isn't um, axial elongation going on uh, behind the scenes? And um, we are now um, looking at biometry and axial length measurements in our practice, and I'm to provide some sort of an answer on that. I apologize. It appears that we have lost Russell in the audio. Let me see if I can let him know that there is an issue. And he may have to adjust something. I apologize. Hello. 
I'm not sure what's going on, but I um. Testing, can you hear me now? We can hear you now, Russell. Thank you. It's a glitchy system, and I apologize to everyone. Oh, thank you for letting me know. Well, we're really well on the very last slide, so um, if it had to happen, it's happened at the right point. So I'm just um, uh, wrapping up and looking at the, the trail we've blazed here uh, across this um, somewhat uncharted territory, and I'd like to conclude uh, if if I can, by thanking everybody for, for being with me this morning. Thank you for your attention, and uh, thanks again to the, uh, the sponsors. And I do believe, Angela, that we may have a few moments left for some questions. We so, um, Angela, I hope uh, you that came in. Have I any questions? I'd be happy to take them. Um, I wanted to thank everyone for attending, and also thank Contact Lens of Australia for to participating in the webinar. Um, Russell or Graham would like to extend an offer of 10% off any CRT set and no charge for the software. So if you're interested in this offer and you've attended the webinar, please feel free to read, reach out to Russell or I, or I'm sorry, Graham or I, and we will be more than glad to honor that offer. The first question that we have, and please feel free to type in a question, is what do you intensively clean the lenses with, Russell? Oh, well, that's, um, that's a very uh, easy question to answer because uh, we use the Minicon ProGent system and uh, we prefer to do that in office with our young uh, patients uh, simply because, as uh, we all know, it's a very, very highly toxic system. So um, we very commonly just uh, do that as a routine uh, for patients that we see uh, twice a year. We'll do uh, pretty much a routine routine. Uh, uh, intensive clean at six months and then at 12 months we uh, we most commonly replace the lenses with a, a duplicate new pair for the next 12 months. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions? Uh, please feel free to type them in. I do have another one here, Graham, uh, Russell from Graham Lehman. He would like to know how flat is too flat to consider ortho -K? Haha, <laughs> well, that's a rather intriguing question, Graham. Um, well, I guess what is critical is that we can um, really manufacture a lens with a base curve that can be uh, placed on the eye uh, and, and measure a plano refraction over that lens. So uh, theoretically, we could go as flat as 9.6 or, or 9.8 uh, millimeters because uh, I do believe that at that level, uh, the lens can be manufactured by uh, Paragon. Um, we must bear in mind that once we go beyond um, the 9.2 base curve, then we are outside of the range of the extended uh, diagnostic dispensing unit and um, at that point, we do lose the advantage of the inventory. So any replacement lenses or even the prescription lenses will have to be manufactured and shipped to the patient. So um, in a sense, we are happy if we can keep the uh, prescription to 9.2 or less. However, uh, theoretically, we can go flatter. Terrific. Thank you. And we have... Another question, when do we change the diameter, Russell? Oh, the diameter question. I, um, over the years, um, have to say um, that I have uh, resorted to changing diameter from uh, 10.5 um, to 11 millimeters in an attempt to improve centration only twice. And uh, two out of two times, it made virtually no difference to the behavior of the lens on the eye. So since then, I have um, completely ignored diameter as a variable, and we find that we get good results around about 90% of the time, or 90% plus with our fittings, with the 10.5 uh, millimeter diameter. Um, I, I'm not obviously a fan of changing diameter. When I initially did, 
uh, corneal reshaping. It was with the um, the Mountford BE lens, and that was an 11 millimeter diameter system. And uh, in in the early days, I was a little concerned that 10.5 millimeters might be a problem, but um, I'm, I'm long past that, and uh, I find now that um, we, we do get tremendous success with the 10.5 millimeter lens, and when that lens isn't centering, either we need to back off the return zone and just release the pressure a little, or we need to consider refitting the lens into a dual axis design. Um, so let me assure you that um, the dual axis design will improve centration uh, many, many times when we have a bit of an issue uh, on an astigmatic periphery cornea and increasing the diameter um, has very, very little effect. Okay, then thank you very much, Russell. Uh, another question. Despite the lack of research, do you believe the BOZD or the aspheris of the base curve may have an effect on the effectiveness of myopia control. <laughs> yes, great question. Well, look, um, I have to be very careful here because we just don't have uh, the research as, as the questioner acknowledges to uh, enable uh, uh, a strong claim to be made here. So what I believe really doesn't matter. Uh, I have to be very careful to avoid practitioner bias and try and be scientific. Um, but as I really indicated in the presentation, um, we have hundreds of young patients who have gone from months to years with no change in their prescription for Paragon CRT lenses. And prior to coming in to see me, they were alarmingly progressive in their myopia. Many of them were increasing with their myopia in the order of one diopter per year. And some of these young patients were up to five diopters. We put them into Paragon CRT and we sit back and we observe them over four, five, six years and that base curve is stable most of the time. It is very rare that we have to change the base curve. And when we have an optical system with an eyeball and a rigid lens with um, a constant base curve representing the front surface of the optical system, if there is a change in the refraction over that lens system, I cannot imagine anything else that can be changing other than the axial length of the eye. So if that axial length is not changing, for me, that probably suggests that the myopia is not changing. But we do need axial length to be 100% clear and confident in, uh, in stating that. So I, I, I can't really um, cross the line yet uh, and say I know that we have myopia control, but boy, oh boy, it sure looks like myopia control. <laughs> let's, let's say that much. Terrific. Uh Okay, let's see. Sarah Sweeney or Sarah from Brisbane, she wanted to thank you. And also uh, would like to know which drops you recommend for the installation and before insertion and removal of the lens. Okay, well, that's a great question. Thank you, Sarah. Look, I, um, I'm a great fan of um, an unpreserved lubricant drop. So broad answer is that as long as the drop has no preservative, then uh, I'm happy with that. Um, I think with our young patients uh, who are using uh, lubricants uh, every day, we want to avoid preservative uh, on a regular basis. Now what's my favorite? Well, I have a, a, a real um, personal preference um, uh, for the uh, Theratiz drop, I think it's a very sophisticated eye drop, and we get great results with that. But really, um, I think provided that it's uh, got no preservative, uh, I think that is probably the key uh, issue here. Um, I, I might add that um, the whole uh, uh, concept of um, managing the post lens tear film and trying to establish homogeneity across that. Uh, lens 
is an unexplored area of research and um, I, I think this is something that uh, deserves a lot more attention than uh, we have given it uh, to date um, because I think this is the major reason for our patients uh, showing a little bit of um, uh, variation in their results from day to day. Uh, thank you for that question. And I believe we have two more and that should wrap it up. What uh, happens if there is against the rules cylinder as residual refraction following overnight wear? Okay, um, great question. So against the rule astigmatism is no longer as scary for me as it used to be at the very beginning. I find that a great deal of against the rule astigmatism is not limbus to limbus. So I would advise that um, when a patient presents with against the rule astigmatism that you have a very, very close look at your pre-treatment topography maps and try to fully understand just how extensive that astigmatic zone on the cornea is and you'll you'll often observe that uh, the astigmatism resides within the central six millimeters of the corneal cap and in those instances it pretty much vanishes without any um, special attention with a spherical CRT lens. Now when we have uh, astigmatism of any kind following overnight treatment that wasn't there before the treatment without the lens on the eye, so this is like um, a residual astigmatism, again I am not overly concerned. Um, <laughs> that might sound a little wild but um, it really isn't all that uncommon. Uh, we can get all sorts of strange refractive effects um, from time to time over the first one or two days of treatment as the treatment is uh, taking hold across the central cornea. So um, provided you've done a very careful um, workup with your fitting exam and you're happy with the fit before you did overnight wear, and the refraction over that lens was plano, I would just simply hang on there, hang in there, and um, not get too phased by a little bit of um, early um, residual or apparent astigmatism in the early days of treatment. Just ask the patient to come back again uh, after another two or three nights of treatment and see how, how things uh, get on. And most often you'll find that within the first week or so that uh, cylinder just um, disappears as the treatment takes hold. Um, if it doesn't, you'll be able to examine the, um, the post-treatment maps on the topographer and you will be able to identify with some experience um, more or less where things are, are not working well and, and I would um, take any um, action based more on what I'm seeing with the topographer than what I'm me uh, measuring with a, a subjective refraction. So I think if you refer back to my uh, initial webinar, you'll see that I'm a big fan of using the topographer more than subjective refraction um, for follow-up of the patient and making clinical de management decisions. Uh, thanks. That was a fairly complex uh, answer, a complex question. I thank you for that. hope it uh, makes some sense. Thank you. And uh, we have a question about the fee structure. What, what is benign, beyond the initial fitting, yearly fee, and cost per visit? How do you structure that, and how often are the follow-ups? <laughs> if you think that's... Well, look, the follow-up... Um, uh, let me avoid the fee thing uh, at first and just say the follow-up is, is in the early days it's really based on, on performance. So we find that the majority of our simple straightforward um, fittings um, require uh, probably about four follow-up visits or so three or four mm -hmm. visits. Um, we had the day one visit, we'll have a follow-up at one week, two weeks after that, maybe a week after that. 
everything's hunky-dory, very little has to be done, it's really just a, a question, the follow-up visits are all about um, monitoring patient compliance and making sure the patient is happy with what they're doing, usually the treatment is working just fine, and, and then we resort to um, uh, maybe a, a, a three visits or two visits a year follow-up uh, regime. However, once in a while we, we, we find that um, we have a patient with one eye uh, in particular or occasionally with uh, two eyes that just aren't responding so well to treatment, that's when we have to dig in and do a lot more work for follow-up. And sometimes I'll see patients every week or maybe twice a week <coughs> until I know I'm on top of the problem. And um, I consider this a very worthwhile investment in time because if we can get the problem sorted out in the early days, then we've got a patient for probably five or ten years and, um, and that's just going to be a joy to manage over the, uh, the following uh, years. So a little bit of extra work up front is, uh, is often worthwhile. Uh, look, I really don't think I'm going to address fees. Um, uh, there's no real magic formula for fees. Um, everybody probably does it a little bit differently and it's really outside the seminar or webinar to talk about fees. Um, we'll address we some of the, the fee trust. development. We can address some of the fee development in the lecture that we're going on, the webinar we're going to have in, in uh, September, Russell. Angela, I was hoping you might um, you might do that and uh, relieve me of that. We're losing you again, Russell. Okay, well, um, I, I think we're just about done. What do you think, Angela? Well, we have two more quick questions. I think one of them will, will be pretty quick. What is the minimum per prescription you would start CRT? Oh, that's a great question. I would think probably somewhere in the order of minus 1 to minus 150. I don't want to start any lower than that because I really want the patient to see the difference. Uh, in addition to that, there is uh, the possibility that at a very low level of um, myopia, in the order of minus 1 or less, the treatment zone may not generate enough aspherosity to actually provide um, a benefit in terms of um, uh, reducing that uh, hyperopic blur. So you probably need about minus 1.5 to minus 2 diopters of myopia to generate a treatment zone with sufficient aspherosity for um, the management to work. So um, there is around about at, 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 um, at a minimum, I would say, nothing less than minus one at the very least. And the very last one is in terms of the OCT machine. Would you, do you find a 15.5 millimeter anterior scan or 8 millimeter anterior scan makes much difference in troubleshooting for ortho -K? Wow, that's a question that goes beyond my expertise, I'm sorry to say, and as much as I would love to have an OCT, we do not enjoy um, that level of uh, technology in the practice yet, but I, um, we're, we're working very hard to acquire one, um, but no, I, I, I don't use OCT, I just use corneal topography, that's my mainstay, my main instrument, so sorry, can't help you with that one. Um, okay, in, in the fee schedule, she was just asking if it was the cost per year per visit or is there just a cost per visit or a yearly fee? She wanted to clarify her question. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Angela, I still believe that's your ground. But okay. We, uh, and I would be more than glad we, to email you and discuss that. that with you further if you don't mind. I missed that, sorry Angela. I will probably uh, email her if you'd like Russell and we can finish that, we, we can finish discussing it that then. Okay, look can I just briefly say that uh, we do have a, uh, a fee package, a treatment fee that we define as being for a three month period Then after that we uh, resort uh, to a more or less a fee per visit basis. Um, but, you know, anything is possible and uh, I'll leave uh, 
the various options to you, Angela, at the next uh, webinar. Terrific. Well, thank you very much, Russell. And again, thank you, Contact Glenn Center of Australia. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me. I can forward them to Contact Glenn Center. Um, any response? Again, we will have another, there are two, possibly three webinars that are going to be available by the rest, for the rest of the year. And we'll contact everyone as uh, we get closer to the dates. Okay, thank you very much, Angela. Thank you, Russell. Have a good, thank you. good day. And thank you for all the attendees. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Bye-bye.